Imagine a life unbound by financial constraints, where passions are pursued, dreams are realized, and communities are enriched. In our final segment, we'll explore the profound impact of financial independence on lifestyle and personal fulfillment. Through the stories of early retirees, we'll uncover the joy and challenges of a life lived on one's own terms. Continue to watch as we journey into a world where money is a tool, not a tether, and discover what it means to truly be free. Earlier, Dr. Keisha talked about, sometimes you just need a break. Like, how do you know when you want to pursue fire versus when you just need a sabbatical? Well, that's a great question. If you're experiencing burnout and you may be still in your 20s, 30s, or 40s, you may just need the break. But I think the important thing to understand is many people know that they need a break. However, they don't have the finances to take the break. They don't have the reserves. They don't. They hadn't been putting away more than what traditional wisdom would say, 10 or 15 percent. You know, if I'm being generous, someone may have said 20 percent if I'm being generous. Right. So if you've been just putting away 10 percent for you know 10 years or so, you may not feel comfortable with taking that break because you may not have enough invested. But I would say. I think it should be commonplace for us to be able to take a career sabbatical. I'm a PhD and in, I, as a tenured professor, when I was a professor, uh, as a tenured professor, that, that was one of the benefits. We are awarded a sabbatical once every seven to 10 years. And let me tell you, <laughs> that was like a breath of fresh air to have five or six months off and still receive your pay so you can keep your same standard of living, but step away to rest. This country is not about rest. It's about work. And I think so many of us need a break. Well, I, I'm, I'm advocating for both a sabbatical, career sabbatical, and a daily siesta, but that has not happened yet. Doc G, I think you wanted to weigh in. You know, I was just going to say that I, I, I think the either or proposition doesn't work. Um, are we going after fire or are we taking a sabbatical? I think the bigger question is, are we living the life we want to lead? And then we can kind of work both of those things in, right? So, you know, an example I often give one I wrote, I wrote about in my book is a gentleman who I call for the book Ernesto, but he was a patient of mine. I'm a hospice doctor, so I was taking care of him at end of life. He was dying of leukemia in his 40s, but in his 20s, he took a sabbatical to go climb Mount Everest. And he took a whole year off. He trained half the year. He went to go climb it. He made about halfway up. The weather changed. They had to come back down. He went back to work and continued in his career. And of course, that year did take something away. Like he was climbing up the corporate ladder. It slowed him down. He might have missed out on some experiences. But on his deathbed in his 40s, all he wanted to talk about was his trip to Mount Everest. So... We make it an either or proposition, but I think what we have to really do is say, well, what is life and how do I want to live it? For Ernesto, living life was going to try to climb Mount Everest in his 20s. And thank God he did because he would have never gotten a chance in his 40s when he got sick and died. So the idea is not to put off life, but to live it today. And then we can build our finances around that. So you don't have to go for fire. You don't have to go for some net worth number. What you need to do is start thinking about how money is going to serve you and not just money, but all those other tools you have, like your youth and your time and your passions and your connections. How are all those gonna, things going to serve you to live the life you want to live? And so if I think if we start with that, if we start with purpose, then the money questions tend to fall in place because then it just becomes a simple question. Like, do I have enough money to support myself to take these six months off? Yes, that might mean I work a few years longer at some point in the future, but that trade-off might be worthwhile for you. I love what you were saying. And I would also say it's a lot that you don't necessarily know your purpose. Like, because I think sometimes people can get stuck 
looking for the purpose. Like they, there's, it's like back to the perfection, right? Like you gotta have, find the purpose. And I think part of finding the purpose is in the doing and exploring and the trying different things too. And having some compassion and grace for yourself in that process. But this idea of living a fully integrated life and that all of your resources, that you were tremendously resourced, uh, our inner resources, you know, our capabilities and, and that we should, it's, it should be a fully integrated life. And, and, and then the decision tree is very simple to your point. You know, if I want to do a certain thing, it's really obvious how much money I, I need, quote unquote, yeah. right? I don't want to understate this point because you, you brought it out that this idea that actually finding your purpose is not always, always easy, the easiest thing. And in fact, there is such thing as purpose anxiety and studies show that 91% of people at some point in their life have purpose anxiety. On the other hand, we also know this, uh, the medical studies show that people with a sense of purpose live longer, are healthier, mm -hmm. and are generally happier. So actually, this is, is going to be the subject of my next book. But there's a little bit of a paradox around purpose. And so we have to get smarter about how we look at purpose itself, too, and have to start working on that anxiety-ridden part of it uh, and minimizing that so that purpose can do all those great things that it does for us uh, without actually making us upset. I mean, I think half the reason people concentrate on things like fire is because they have purpose anxiety and want to put it off. It's the rabbit. Financial independence retire early. It's this movement that people either think about their following or not following. But it sounds to me that fire gets you to think about money and talk about money which is something that everybody should be doing. So it shouldn't really be a movement. This is like people need to be thinking about purpose and money and retirement and investing. These are like foundational aspects of a successful life. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I'm curious. I'm curious. I, can I ask a question, Andy? Is that okay? I love Absolutely. to get I love to get the feedback. What are some what are some ways? I mean, what what do we do to help those? Because let's face it, there's a large population who is paycheck to paycheck, struggling in this country, mm -hmm. are not at all prepared for retirement, let alone in early retirement. Okay. How do we, what, what do we need to do in this country to start preparing those in school or younger or uh, right out of high school? Or what, what do we need to start doing to prepare and change those mindsets around, yes, purpose, so doing work you love early on so that you don't get stuck in a career that you don't like or in a job that you don't want, but you have to do it because you need to put food on the table. And so then you're stuck in this conundrum and you can't get out of it. You can't stop and go back to school or, or it's really hard once you've got settled, you have children, you've got to put food on the table. Maybe you didn't get the degree that you wanted to get. What, what do we do? Where do we start? How do, what, how do we help people? Yeah, I mean, you know, the problem is just you're trying to unspill the milk. Right. Mm -hmm. So we are messaged on who we should be and what we should do, both financially and otherwise, from the day we're born, whether it is our parents telling us we should be doctors when we grow up or it's advertising agencies creating a picture of what the good life looks like so they can sell us their products. Or if it's Instagram showing us the newest clothes we should be wearing or the vacations we should be taking, we are pretty much programmed to follow other people's belief of what purpose is, whether that's because they want to show us how great a life they're living or it's an advertiser trying to sell us something. And so it's really now hard to undo the world we've created where purpose is being defined for us. And it part of the problem is we're telling people that they need to go find their purpose by watching Instagram or getting taken in by these commercials, where what we should really be telling them is that they have to start creating their purpose. Purpose is something that you actually create. And the way you do that is you have to start looking at what specifically speaks to your nature. So there's lots of different ways to do this, right? A few quick examples. In hospice, we do a life review with the dying. It's a series of questions 
about people's lives, what was important to them, what were the biggest accomplishments, what were their biggest failures, what were the people in their lives that were important to them, what do they want to accomplish in the little bit of life they have left. So conducting a life review now as a young person actually is a great way to connect with what's been purposeful in your life. That's one way. Another way is to look back at childhood. I mean, most of us have things in childhood that lit us up that we eventually let go of because we were told that you don't do that for a living or that's a kid thing and not an adult thing. Another thing is to look at your jobs. Most people, even if they hate their jobs, can find one little piece they love. And so you start thinking, well, why do I love that piece of my work? And what does that mean about me? Am I finding purpose in that? There are a bunch of other ways, but last but not least, there's the spaghetti against the wall method. Is you, If you truly have no idea what purpose means in your life, you try a bunch of things. You say yes to a bunch of experiences. You throw the spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. Um, I mean, those are just some really quick, simple, back of the napkin ways to start looking at purpose and how you can start thinking about your own purpose. I, I think those I would were add awesome. the good yeah. notes. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Keisha, I think maybe also too, one thing to think about is that there's a lot of systemic shit out there that yeah. we were very like, oh, the individual can do it all, right? But like sometimes like we need to 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 really work on some of the things that make it uh, uh, that really create the conditions under which you have millions and millions and millions and millions of people on an economic treadmill, right? Whether that, that they can't, they, 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 they can't, however well-intentioned or psychic, that it's really, really hard to, to have the luxury of, of, of purpose in a way, although you can always make your purpose and how you live your everyday life. It's in, it's in your purposes in here. But um, I, I think that that's something that we need to do because, you know, if you don't have the 20 bucks to, to, to put aside, you know, but, in, and it's the sort of being able to do whatever small thing matters and small things compound into great things for sure. But I think we also need to look at at, at, and it's, this is really hard, right? Because we can't put it all on the, on the shoulders of the individuals. And yet we have very powerful structures. How do we dismantle them or, or, or change them and, 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 you know, kind of create a, because it's right. Education is tied into people's opportunity set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And, and I, I don't know what the answers are. I, I just know that, that it's, it's, bigger than the individual than millions and millions and millions of individuals too and I, I i don't know where to start chipping away at it i mean you know i do i try to do what i can but that's a very I'm real wrap thing it up lakeisha it's a big question mm -hmm. and it reminds me of something that my father told me he said he loved reading about mother Teresa and read a lot of her books and he told me that many people would ask Mother Teresa, how is it that you can help and touch millions of people impacting their lives? And her advice was just focus on your family. Just take care of your family. Don't think about changing the world. You just have to start at home. And then from there, you go to your community and eventually it grows. But I, you're right. There's a very large problem with a lack of financial literacy and people need help. So I think this group here, everyone is doing their part uh, to spread the money gospel and to help people. So I want to thank you all for joining me for this financial freedom discussion. Thank you for joining us on this live stream, whether you're watching live or you're watching on recording, visit Dr. Keisha at LakeishaSimmons.com. You guys made this easy for me. Doc G is at JordanGrummet.com and Mariko is at MarikoGordon.com. So you, thank you guys for just uh, putting your names and we'll put that in the show notes and I encourage everyone to go visit. I know that Mariko is even doing some workshops and tying it into a Maui fundraiser. Mm -hmm. So go to, go to MarikoGordon.com and check that out. Thank you guys for joining me. And um, I hope that we can do it again. Thank Thanks you so Andy. much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys.